Hello, this is the second video of a series. It's called Justin Rowlett and the most important graph in the world. So I hope I've pronounced that right. Justin Rowlett and the most important graph in the world. So as I say, it's, it's the second of a series of free videos and it's going to be slotted into my Designing the Revolution podcast at some point. But I thought I could put these out because I think they're quite interesting. So last week I did a video uh, called Hobbit Lawyers and Facing Mordor. So that was focusing on the legal profession. What I'm going to do this week is focus on the media. And next week I'm going to look at economics. But really these three areas are an excuse to promote a more general thesis, which is people in the reformist space, the more that they do good things and stay within the rules, um, the worse will be the outcome in terms of the climate crisis and the ecolog ecological catastrophe that's coming down the road. So that's what I'm going to be arguing in these free podcasts, in these free videos. So the reason I'm talking about Justin is because I met him at the Glastonbury Festival last year. And you might have seen one or two videos of me being interviewed by him and I'm looking a bit grumpy because he's asking me all these bad questions. <laughs> anyway, so I'll come on to how all this fits together in a minute. So this podcast of um, this podcast series on designing the revolution is going to be about forty podcasts, and all the information about it will be below this video. And the general proposition, just to recap on what I said last week in the other video, is. The general proposition is that the climate crisis, the physics of the climate crisis, has got to such a point that there's going to be major social breakdown, major social disruption, and this inevitably is going to lead to revolutionary episodes in the Western world. And the reason I'm saying that is because we're already at 1.5 degrees centigrade, We've got 1.5 degrees, for the sake of argument, locked in with global dimming, the carbon lag, Arctic melt. At some point between one and three degrees, we're going to have to add 1.5 degrees of extra warming due to um, methane coming out of the melting permafrost. If you've got your little back of the envelope, you'll have added up to 4.5 at four degrees centigrade, according to top scientists in the world, half the world will be uninhabitable, billions of people will have died of starvation, and most significantly, between one and three degrees, according to peer-reviewed papers, we will be triggering uh, feedback mechanisms that will take us to hot house earth, which takes us conservatively over five degrees, and that's the realm of effective or absolute human extinction. So incidentally, that's what I said in court, by the way, a few weeks ago, which I suspect uh, contributed to me being found not guilty. So I'm not going to talk about that much, but that grounds us somewhat in the horrors that are coming down the line. But what I'm arguing in these three series, these three videos, is there's another reason why revolution is inevitable, which is that the reformist and liberal classes, broadly defined, are literally incapable of engaging in the structural reforms that are necessary at this point in time. And therefore, the contradictions within the social space will get to such a point where revolutionary episodes will happen. So just to remind people, I'm not saying that revolutions or reform in and of themselves are good or bad things. I'm taking a sociological orientation on this. Um, but obviously, 
we're hoping that this inevitable revolution will have a sort of pro-social democratic um, essence uh, rather than a fascistic one. All right, so broadly speaking, what I'm going to be arguing is that the reason the liberal class, broadly defined, as I said, is incapable of carrying out the transformation that we objectively need, at least partially is due with cowardice and personal characteristics like that. But actually, the underlying reason is a lot more serious because it's structural in terms of the psychology of that class. And as I discussed last week, this has got a close connection with what you might call the Eichmann syndrome. So if you didn't watch the video and you just want to be reminded or you don't know about Eichmann, Eichmann was a leading Nazi who was kidnapped by the Israelis in, I think, 1961. He went to trial in, in Israel and he was responsible, broadly speaking, for all the logistics and transformation of the Jews and various other groups of people who were murdered in the Holocaust. And when Hannah um, Arendt wrote a book called Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, studying the banality of evil, it caused a storm because her general thesis was that this guy was reasonably ordinary in particular respects. And the particular respects in which he was ordinary was because he was following the rules. He believed in staying in the law and he was obeying orders. So I'll come back to that during this video. So, as you may know, I did social scientific research at King's College for four or five years, and I watched a lecture by a woman who was a famous researcher, and it was quite interesting because she said she doesn't really like looking at macro stats, particularly stats that are liable to get corrupted because they're politically important. What she liked to do is look at the small stories that have big implications. And a classic example of this is the film, The Big Short. So if you've seen this film, I mentioned this in other videos, I mean, it's really interesting, which is you know, you've got all these stats about the potentiality of a big crash 2008 and what have you. But in the film, the thing that really brings it home is this guy gets out, out of the stats, out of the computer, um, out of in front of the computer. He actually goes and talks to people. So he goes to talk to sex workers in Florida and these people have got five mortgages and, you know, they're not earning much money. And it becomes a no-brainer that this whole housing bubble is going to collapse and it's going to have catastrophic implications. So that's a classic example of looking at a little story, a little piece of frontline data and drawing a big conclusion from it. So I've been doing my own little bit of research on this. It started off in an inadvertent way. So I've talked to a lot of prominent liberal figures, as you might say, over the last you know, three or four years. I went to speak to the editor of The Guardian, the director of Greenpeace, various Tory politicians, various other public figures. And as I've mentioned again on other videos, the experience was appalling. <laughs> Let's put it like that, uh, to put it mildly, because it became very clear that these people had no emotional ability to connect with the suffering and injustice that is coming down the line. So then I decided when I went to Glastonbury, I, had to, I came up with this idea, I was just going to systematise this in, in a way with Justin. So just to say a little bit about Justin Rowlett, in case you don't know who he is. So he's the chief environment correspondent of the BBC. Is that right? Just like checking there. Um, so he's a cool guy, if you ever is watching this. Hello, Justin. No personal criticism, as it were. Um, yeah, he's what you might call progressive. He wears jeans when he's doing interviews at COP. 
Um, I think he mentioned a while ago that millions of people might die and consequently he got into a bit of trouble for saying the obvious. So he's in that, in that sphere of progressive liberal sort of guy and quite well known, got a lot of social power potentially. So what I did is I showed him a graph and I'm going to show you this graph. So I'm just reminded at this point is I saw a film, I've forgotten what the film is, by some famous scientist and he comes up with this amazing, amazing formula <laughs> and I think he spills coffee on it and he writes it out on the back of a cornflake packet. So my proposition to you is the graph I'm going about to show you is the most important graph in the world and maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it's my opinion for what it's worth. But what I, what I would say is, is you're not going to see the most important graph in the world on a, on a TED video, right, with all that, you know, all that razzmatazz around it. It's going to, if you're going to find out the most important graph in the world, it will be some guy with a thousand views on YouTube uh, with a bit of paper. Um, that's what I suggest. All right, so here we go then. So get myself organised. Hopefully you can see all this. So this is the reformist liberal logic of the last 30 years. So this is effectiveness up here. It's what's called a normal distribution curve. And the place of maximum effectiveness is here, five, okay? So what do these mean? Basically these are points on what you call, might call NGO liberal world, reformist world. So this is, I don't know, talking to your friend at school or at college, nothing that dramatic. Um, here's the most effective thing, lobbying, uh, petitions, maybe making the odd video, what have you. That's what they do. And the reason they do it is because in their world, it's the most effective. And then there's a sleep, steep decline as you start doing more tricky stuff, you know, getting arrested, going to prison. The, in NGO world, these are what you might call, as my supervisor once said to me, these are the things that make you irrelevant. They put off the public, you know, all that sort of stuff. OK, so we're familiar with this because this is the paradigm that's been communicated in the climate change world for the last 30 years, you know, go to COP, uh, maybe do a little demonstration there, but definitely don't do a 10. All right, so that's not the graph, by the way, that's just the introduction. Here we are, here's the main graph. So again, you've got NGO world here, the liberal world, we just explained that. But this is the empirical reality. So just, just to make this clear, I'm not making some big ideological point here. I'm not saying that direct action or NGO activity is in and of itself bad or good. I'm just being an empirical social scientist. That's what I did at King's College. So my empirical research showed that actually in terms of creating the structural change which is objectively needed on the climate crisis, like all of this is utterly hopeless. Let's put it like that, right? Doesn't do anything. And at a certain point, it takes off when you're approaching at number 10. So the reason why all of this has been hopeless is because carbon emissions have gone up by 60%. You know, UK emissions have gone down by what, 5 10% in 30 years because we're just getting China to produce everything for us and all the rest of it. In other words, all of this has been irrelevant. It's been a catastrophic failure. You know, this is COP. COPs have done nothing. All the rest of it, right? Here's the BBC. They do a nature programme every now and again. Nothing happens. If you want to actually use the analysis, empirical analysis, things start to happen when you get towards point 10. So... Again, don't just believe me on this. Um, I've done stuff on this in other videos, but I'm going to briefly give you some data points and I could talk to you about 
three hours and can give you dozens of data points, but I'm just going to choose a selection of them. And I'm hoping that as a reasonable person looking at this, you can say, yeah, this sort of makes sense. So let's start with King's College. So in King's College four or five years ago, there was a campaign to get the college to divest from fossil fuels. They've been going for three years. They got on various committees, they on various petitions, you know, they're heading around here and their effective nurse was zilt, right? Nothing was happening. They'd just done a corporate strategy. There was nothing of any substance about the climate in there, maybe a few warm words. And then I came along with like five or six students around here and we threw paint over the central hall of King's College called a big rumpus. Then I went on hunger strike for, for uh, two weeks. And within those two weeks, the college completely changed their, their strategy, their corporate strategy on, on the climate. They agreed to divest from fossil fuels within three years. They agreed to make King's College carbon neutral um, within five years. In other words, it was up here, right? It was massively effective because it was towards number 10. Um, so let's choose another example. So in Germany, you know, there's Fridays for a future here. You know, XR had done a few things here. And then there's this guy that I spoke to. He wanted to... Um, get his college to divest, I said, you know, it's entirely up to you what you do, but if you want my, you know, academic advice, as you might say, <laughs> if you want to be effective, then it's a good idea to throw paint over the college. And he threw a little bit of paint over it. So we got about 5,000 views, maybe this was here. And I said, with all due respect, if you're going to be effective, you need to throw a lot more paint on it. So he got five big, big, um, fire extinguishers and threw a massive amount of paint over it and he got 200,000 views on social media. So he put about here, got suspended. I don't quite know what happened, but he was in the news and became a bit of a, a significant figure in Germany. That then propelled him, uh, gave him the credibility to build an organisation called Last Generation that started sitting on motorways copying into Lake Britain and as you may know at this precise moment in time it's the biggest climate campaign arguably ever in Germany it's got millions of views it's raised over a million euros I think and it's got a demand to I think limit the speed of cars on motorways to 70 miles an hour 65 miles an hour, I think it is. And the region of Hamburg has just agreed with it. I think some other regions have agreed with it. Judges are refusing to prosecute them. Blah, blah, blah. So let's say for the sake of argument, it's up here. Because, again, direct action works. Um, so if you're in the UK, you're familiar with this story with Insulate Britain you know, 80% name recognition within two weeks. Biggest name recognition campaign in recent decades. You're familiar with Extinction Rebellion, producing 67% um, of the country supporting climate emergency in 2019. So we've got overwhelming number of data points where the NGOs are going to say privately, you know, Extinction Rebellion did more in two weeks than they did in 30 years, broadly speaking. So as a, you know, reasonably competent social scientist, that's going to be my graph, isn't it? It's pretty obvious if you're going to be, um, if you're going to be serious about your empirical research. So just to continue on this, just to give a few more elaborations on it. What's interesting is all the biggest effective campaigns in the Western world 
um, over the last 12, 18 months, I would estimate have been created by around 500 people, believe it or not, out of a population of, you know, maybe a billion. In other words, a very small number of people can substantially create effectiveness by engaging in direct action. That's quite an important point. And that's why this is the most important graph in the world, because it shows you what works when you're trying to prevent the potential death of billions of people. The stats don't lie. And just to elaborate a bit more on this, um, last week, this tech guy showed me all the hits that these A22 projects, last generation, just up oil and what have you around the Western world have produced. And last year they produced, I think it was about four and a half million press articles. And that was four times the number of hits or articles that um, had been produced by Fridays for a Future and Extinction Rebellion. So again, I'm not trying to be, you know, unpleasant about this. <laughs> you know, I helped set up Extinction Rebellion, for instance. But so here's, you know, Friday's Future and Extinction Rebellion and, you know, multiple four, here's A22. And here's BBC correspondence, as we'll come and find out. All right, so you've got the general idea. So what I want to add to this is there's an amplifier effect, right? So historically, what we find is if ordinary people engage in civil resistance around here, maybe they get to about here. But there's a massive opportunity. And of course, with opportunity comes responsibility, dare I say it for public figures to amplify a cause uh, historically uh, enormously because of their fame and their moral integrity. So I'm going to give you three examples of this. So the first example is Bertram Russell. I don't know if you've heard of this guy, but in World War I, he, was a, he disagreed with the slaughter of billion, millions of people in the trenches and he did various forms of public action. He ended up in prison for six months. This was national news. It made millions of people talk about it. So the action against the slaughter in World War I was around here. And when Bertrand Russell did something, you know, it shot up here, massive national conversation about it. In 1970, um, and I mentioned this in my last video, and there's a film about it, the Washington Post received the Pent Pentagon Papers and the editor decided to publish them even though it was illegal. And if it just been, you know, some student activists doing direct action about the government lying, lying on, the, on the Vietnam situation, you know, maybe they've got to about here, you know, doing great stuff, but no one's really that interested. Once the Washington Post and the editor of the Post had gone public, it propelled it up to here, and arguably that was the end of the Vietnam project, certainly contributed to it in a material way, that the, the expose that the American government had been lying to the, the American people. So you're starting to see a pattern here. Then the classic example is Gandhi, in India, I think in 1946, he may have done this twice, but after World War II, the British were going to leave India and to cut a long story short, there was a massive confrontation between extreme Hindus and extreme um, uh, Muslims and they started killing each other and Gandhi said, I'm going to go on a fast, I'm going to die uh, from not eating if if these people continue to kill each other. And it was a major, 
that's a major problem, right? I mean, potentially, I don't know what the numbers are, but I think there are over a million or two people were killed. So he went on a fast, and because he was so famous, because he was a figure of integrity, this single act of direct action, sacrificial action, stopped effectively all the killing in a matter of weeks. I can't remember how long it was. Um, so again, you know, if some normal people had been trying to do activism around it, then maybe they got to about here. <clears throat> Once Gandhi came along, poing, super effective, direct sacrificial action done by a public figure. So I can't help mentioning Gary Lineker, dare I say it, <laughs> because um, yesterday um, something quite significant happened, and this is another key case study. So Gary Lineker, as I'm sure most people watching this video know, enormously respected public figure, cultural figure, ex-footballer, um, um, what have you. So he puts out a statement saying, you know, what's happening with the refugees in the UK is terrible. The language reminds him of Nazi Germany and what have you. So people have been saying this for ages. You know, the NGOs are about here saying it. If some people did direct action, it'd be about here. You've got the idea. As soon as Gary Lineker says it, it's up here. But what's propelled it into, into the news is it's not just he's saying it. It's that the BBC is trying to get rid of him. So it becomes the drama of direct action. It's sacrificial. There's a confrontation between the good and the bad. And everyone's talking about it. Bang. You know, it's not quite at Gandhi's level. Sorry about that, Gary. <laughs> but, yeah, let's say it's about here. OK, so you get, you get the general gist. So the idea in my little social scientific project is to, to go to public figures and Justin was my first victim, as you might say, and um, I want to see where he is along this curve, having explained in the last 10 minutes what, um, you know, the general empirical robustness of it. Um, and then what what I decided to do was to rate him. It's a bit unscientific, but I was going to rate him between 1 and 10. So 10 is, oh my God, Roger, absolutely, you know, I'm going to go and glue myself to the desk of the BBC director. I'm going to lay down some ultimatum. I'm definitely getting to get thrown out. I can see my massive ability to do the right thing and change public opinion and, you know, contribute in some material way to structural change in the climate. So that's like a number of 10, or maybe not. Um, so let's see how, how well he did. So I decided to um, have three, three um, sections to this. So I don't know if you're familiar with these phrases, but often when you're progressing through something, you can be unconsciously incompetent, which means you don't even know you've got a problem <laughs> uh, and you have got a problem. And then there's consciously incompetent, which means you know you've got a problem. Uh, you know you face a challenge, but you're not going to do anything about it or it's very difficult for you to do something about it. And then you've got consciously competent, which is you've got there and you don't even need to think about it because it's the obvious thing to do and you've become good at something. All right. So with Justin, Justin Rowlett, I called him over. I said, Justin, I just want to have like a few minutes with you. I went through this. I said, look, with all due respect, according to the empirical evidence, you know, doing your normal stuff on the BBC is here on effectiveness. It's not here, with all due respect. And if you want to be effective and engage in moral action, save the next generation and all the rest of it, just being analytical. You want to be over here and give your ultimatum 
will say it's not millions of people that are going to die, it's billions of people, you know, choose a campaign, it's been done a hundred times before, do an ultimatum, go and state your case, do a Gary Lineker routine, and you know, you're going to be up here according to the best scientific um, social research. So I, w I was going to give him free. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just thinking about it. I was thinking, I'm being a bit falsely biased because I really like him. I mean, he's a nice guy, but it, it's not true. It's a two. In other words, like he was unconsciously incompetent in, in the sense that he looked at this and it, the interaction was only about two or three minutes. And he looked at it and he looked vaguely panicky, if I remember rightly. And I don't think he could comprehend it. Or, you know, you can speculate whether he could consciously comprehend it or not. But he was definitely unconsciously, unconsciously incompetent. In other words, like if he'd been consciously incompetent, he would have gone, yes, Roger, this is really interesting. I understand this. You know, I know I need to be there, but I really can't because I'm too scared. And, you know, I've got my career to think about. He didn't do that. He just didn't even engage. He engaged a little bit, maybe. Um, so again, if he's listening to this and wants to do it again, feel free. You can have another, you know, bite at the cherry just here. <laughs> but unfortunately, um, got two. And seriously speaking, the two is quite significant because that, that, that data uh, supports this general hypothesis of these three videos, which is that it's not about people consciously deciding to be bad, right? Um, it's deeper than that, which makes it worse, right? We're not talking about whether Justin's a good or bad person as his self-understanding or of our sort of observation. That's not the issue. The issue is what is there something structural happening here? So there's two reasons um, let's say there's two reasons why people in the reformist, NGO, liberal, you know, reformist space are consciously incompetent when it comes to the overwhelming evidence of what they need to do in order to fulfil their responsibilities the next thousand generations. So it's true there's a certain amount of what's called herding. So what herding means is all the, B all the, all the other BBC correspondents are... Um, are doing the same routine, right? They've, they've all, they're all from the same background. They've all set, got the same level of privilege. You know, 80, 90% of them, for the sake of argument, have gone to Oxbridge. Most of the, you know, a lot of them have done politics, philosophy and economics, as Justin has. They're in a herd. And the definition of a herd in terms of human psychology is when you get information you don't like, you don't believe it. So I'll say that again. Information you don't like, you don't believe. And there's robust psychological research that shows this is a major, major phenomenon. But the main reason why people like Justin can't handle it is because of this Eichmann uh, syndrome, as I, as I might call it. In other words, they believe there's rules, they believe there's the law which they should obey, and generally speaking, if they're given parameters by the BBC, by Murdoch, you know, all these media figures, they're not going to move out of it. Not, you know, obviously there's a certain amount of cowardice in it, but that's not the real, true horror of it, the true horror of it, is they actually believe that by staying in the rules, they'll actually be more effective. <laughs> they actually believe something that's empirically um, rubbish. Um, so this raises a really sort of interesting issue, which is, this class of people, this culture of people, their self-understanding is there at the apex of rationality, the apex of scientific, empirical, 
robustness. That's what their self-understanding is. And at this point in history, they're engaging in the most stupendous act of intellectual stupidity because they cannot accept that they're living the most enormous lie, which is, number one, we're heading for civilizational collapse, and number two, only revolutionary activity at this stage, i.e. high-level direct action, is ever going to save us. I'll just remind you, these are people that have been educated at Oxford and Cambridge. These are people that have done the PPE course. And they're all catastrophically stupid at this stage of history. And as a little aside, you know, one of the sort of darkly hilarious things about this is this is the class of people that go around putting down people who voted for Brexit people that engage in conspiracy theories. And yet, they're completely blind to the biggest lie in our society, which is not Brexit and which is not conspiracy theories. The biggest lie in our society is that we're not heading for catastrophe and that normal reformist activity is going to actually do anything at this stage of history. I mean, just consider 28 cops that facilitated a 60% increase in carbon emissions. Only a person that is completely mad is going to deny the complete waste of time. And arguably, one of the reasons why ordinary people will work for Brexit and will get engaged in conspiracy theories is because they sense that the elites have completely lost it and maybe they're imitating them in some way. I'll just give you a little story of, you know, I can't help giving you this little story, which again, I've said on some videos, but when I did the hunger strike at King's College, being a naive rationalist that I was at the time, um, I thought, wow, you know, if you go on hunger strike for 14 days, and let's not blow this out of proportion, right? Going on a hunger strike for 14 days, it's not at all pleasant, but it's not going to do you in, or at least most people, most of the time. You know, people go on fasts all the time for their health or religious purposes. No one blinks an eyelid. If you go on a, fort, a fortnight fast for the sake of argument, you've got a 50, 80% chance of forcing a uh, British university to divest from fossil fuels. That seems like a reasonable hypothesis. And several people went on hunger strike in other British universities and they got a result within nine days, 12 days, as opposed to three years. So when I went to the director of Greenpeace, being the naive rationalist I was, I said to him, well, why don't you, you know, organise a national campaign with 350.org, with People and Planet and all these other people, let's just get the job done. I mean, after all, it's the biggest crisis in human history. And it was total silence. You know, a few people put on social media, oh, Roger Hamm's done something quite interesting. It's like, no, it's not quite interesting. It's fucking like the main show. <laughs> it's like it's the main show. Just roll it out and get, get on with it, right? This is what the younger generation need to know. They need to do direct action. They need to get suspended from university. They need to throw paint over their universities. They need to go on hunger strike. No one's going to die. It's not classical civil resistance. Nothing happened. And it was at that, that was the point at, it, at which it dawned on me in my naivety that, um, yeah, that I was being naive. That what we're dealing with here is a form of mass psychological psychosis by the liberal reformist elites. And that's, an, that's a, an empirical observation. It's not whether I like the elites or not, it's, it's where we're at. So let's, before I finish, um, 
Oh no, no, I've just got to say something else. So, so I just want to remind you and watch, watch the video, the Hobbit video, if you haven't seen it, because it sort of goes with this one. So what I said in the Hobbit video was, you know, Hobbit lawyers facing Mordor, is the judge and the lawyers, they were, they were, if you pushed them on the climate, their response to it would be to double down, double down on doing this better. <laughs> you know, maybe their self-conception is they're either here or here and they go, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to do really well and, and focus on this because they can't get out of, of, of that paradigm. In other words, like what the judge is going to do is look at the law with even more conscientiousness and tell you what the law is, even though the law is completely irrelevant because we're facing this enormous crisis. So he's going to make it worse. And I suspect what Justin would say is, yes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do even better interviews at COP. <laughs> I'm going to try even harder to put the point across at COP that we need to be planting more trees and such like. Because he's still in that framework where he can't conceive that what he's got to do is stand up a cop and say, this is a total load of fucking bollocks. And if the BBC doesn't do a programme on why billions of people are going to die, I'm going to leave the BBC in a fortnight. Bang. It'd be in Gary Linekerville, right? You see, you see what I'm saying? Um, And the reason we're going to have a revolution is because Justin, Justin's not going to do that. Because all, you know, if all these Gary Lineker guys did it, then we would get structural reform now, but we're not going to, you know. Unless, coming on to Gary Lineker, there's about 10 Gary Linekers out there. Never say never. Maybe there is. And obviously I'd love it if there is. And I'd talk to Gary Lineker, dare I say it. He's a great guy. And, um, but he's maybe the exception to the rule at the moment. And I want to say something, you know, let's say something else about Gary Lineker, which is sort of interesting. It's interesting that Gary Lineker isn't actually in the herd, is he? <laughs> the real experts on the climate, you know, the politicians and the academics and the scientists and all the commentators, they're in the herd. They've got the NGO paradigm, but Gary Lineker's like on the, on the edge of that herd, which of course is what the theory would predict if you're on, on the edge of it. He's just a footballer. He's just a cultural figure. It's like a pop star. And often in history, you find that it's this group of people on the, her, on the edge of the herd who actually facilitate revolutionary change because they're the people who come forward, you know, in 1989 in the revolutions against communism. It was the cultural figures that led it, the singers, the intellectuals, you know, people that have been cleaning windows for 30 years because they got pushed out of the system. So, in conclusion, this is a serious matter. I mean, <laughs> it's quite intellectually interesting. But it's a serious matter. It's not just a serious matter. It's the most serious matter in the history of humanity. According to the best scientists, we're looking at billions of deaths over the next 50 years. Maybe less, maybe more. You know, it's an estimate. It doesn't matter if it's an estimate. It is what it is. Um, so there is actually a massive obligation on people like Justin Rowland, Rowlett to do the right thing. And just to clarify, the, what the right thing means is to engage in an ultimatum against the reformist space, which inevitably will lead to you losing your job, which then leads to engaging in civil disobedience to the point of being put, uh, arrested and put in prison, like Bertrand Russell. And to get to the top of the curve, to engage in a hunger strike, to demand structural change, which will save millions of lives, like Gandhi did. And the point, of course, is that this is not a matter of being a saint, 
like Gandhi. It's a matter of saving your kids. It's a, everyone has to be like Gandhi, otherwise we're in big, we're in big trouble at this stage of history. Um, and yes, maybe a miracle will happen and lots of Gandhis will appear, or more mundane Gary Lineker's. Um, but at this stage, it's almost certainly too late. And hence, the reason why revolutions will happen in Western societies in the next 10 to 15 years. And look at the podcast to find out what that's going to look like and how we're going to avoid a fascistic outcome. Thanks very much.